Bible reading for this evening is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This is God's word. Well, this passage tonight that we look at really is a great summary of what's happened in the lives of those who've been baptised tonight. So let's pray before we look at this passage. Our great God, we come before you now asking for your help. We know we need you to work in our lives to be able to be saved, but also to understand your word and understand the truth. We pray, God, that you would give us the understanding. We pray that you would help us. We know we need your help. And I pray, God, tonight for any who don't yet know the message of salvation, who don't yet have the hope that they are forgiven and that their debt has been paid. Father, I pray that you would reveal this to them and that you would show them how they can have forgiveness in Christ. And I pray for all of us, for those who do have this, I pray that we would see again the hope we have in Jesus and that it would set us on fire again to fully honour him with our lives. And we pray this all for his glory. Amen. In my life, I was deceived and lied to for about 16 years. I was lied to by Satan, this world, and even myself. My life was guided by false ideas, and I was left empty and useless by it all. I told myself that God wasn't watching what I did at times, so surely He doesn't know what I'm doing. I tried to convince myself that nothing would come after death, and I would say, I'm not going to be held accountable for all that I've done. Or I even, at times, superstitiously believed, I remember as a kid, that if I could walk up these stairs in the right way or do certain things in a right way, everything would go well. I remember thinking that. And I was told by Satan as well that sin is good, it's sweet, it's lovely, but it only left me ruined and broken. I was a fool. I was lied to and I was deceived. I was taken captive by these ideas and these false thoughts for 16 years of my life and I chased after so many things to fill my life but I was always left empty and I knew it, I knew I was missing what I really needed, something that I really needed. Is it the same for you? Were you like this or are you still today like this? Are you still tonight like this? Don't let the world deceive you, don't be deceived any longer. A little earlier, before our passage, in Colossians 2, verse 8, it says there, if you look, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceitful philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. You see, this, this church here that the le- this letter is written to, the Colossian church, they had false teachers saying that Christ is not enough, Jesus isn't enough, and that they needed something extra. They needed some extra knowledge, or they needed to do certain extra things on top of what Christ had done. And you also face the same kind of lies from Satan at times, or the world, trying to convince you that Jesus isn't enough. Maybe you are told that we are actually good people, we don't need saving. Or you're told that after death, there's nothing, so there's no consequences for what you do right now. Or maybe... You're told or you think that you can work your way to heaven. Or you think that your money, your achievements, they're good enough. They are good enough and that if you get well set up in this life, you will be satisfied. Or maybe you think the Bible is just all about you and it's about a good life now, not so much about God and eternity. These are all false ideas that we hear, that maybe we believe. But Colossians 2 verse 8 here, that verse that we just read, is commanding us to not be taken captive by them. Do not believe them. Don't be enslaved to them or anything but Jesus. 
You need this, and I need this. You need to stop snacking on what never satisfies. You need to stop buying into the philosophies of this world, which are only crumbs. And instead, you need to come and feast on the one thing that can satisfy. You need to come and feast on Jesus and what He has purchased for you. And this passage that we look at now, in Colossians, it shows us the feast that, it, that is in Jesus. It shows us the heartbeat of Christianity, what is key and core to Christianity. It shows what makes Christianity so different to all other religions. It shows us here how that guilt feeling that plagues us all can be dealt with. Here we see what Jesus has done and here we see what satisfies the restless soul. But first, before we see that, we we must see something else. And the passage shows us this as well. We must first see that we are dead. Dead in our sins. We need to see the dead nature of our souls because all humanity is in this terrible state. Have a look at verse 13. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 begins saying, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. So we are dead in our sins. The point is that we are spiritually dead. We're spiritually dead. A physically dead person, they can't do anything physical. A spiritually dead person cannot do anything for their soul. We are unable. We are without life. We are destroyed by the corrupting effects of sin. We're dead in our sin. What does this fully mean? How are we dead in our sin? Well, there's a few aspects. Firstly, To be dead in our sins means that we are slaves to our sin. Another part of the Bible in Romans, actually in John, sorry, it says, Jesus says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. To be dead in our sin means that we are bound to it, captivated by it, and corrupted by it completely. Secondly, to be dead in our sins means that we cannot please God. We cannot please God. Romans 8 verse 8 says, those controlled by the sinful nature, cannot please God. We're unable to. We are unable to do good as well, as Romans 3 says, on our own. Even our best works are like filthy rags, Isaiah says. So this is the second aspect of what it is to be dead in our sin. Also, to be dead in our sin means that we are destroyed by sin's consequences. The picture of being dead in our sins shows the destructive effects of sin. Sin destroys. We've seen it. We see it in life. Sin has brought calamities, hostility, sickness, death, eternal destruction. We see it around us all the time. And then finally, what it means to be dead in our our sin is it means that we are unable to move towards God, unable to seek God. Romans 3, again, shows that no one seeks God on their own. No one understands, not one. On our own, we cannot find God because we are spiritually dead. That's the point. But not only are we dead in our sins, verse 13 has a second description about all of humanity. We are also dead in the uncircumcision of our sinful nature. Now, in the Bible, if you understand the Old Testament, the point of circumcision was to show the covenant and the commitment that Israel had to God and as well that God had to them, the commitment that he had to them. So the point being made here in verse 13 is that when we're in the flesh, when we are not in Christ, we are not united to God or in relation to God in any way. On our own, we are out of covenant with God. We don't have his promises. We don't have his truth. We're rebellious and we have sinful souls instead that need cleansing. This is our state. This is the state of all humanity, spiritually dead. We've been taken captive by sin. This world has been taken captive by sin and it is continually destroyed by it. It shouldn't take you too long to realize that if you look at the world, but also it shouldn't take you too long to realize it if you look at your own life, if you look at your own heart and your own thoughts and what you were like. Just think about it. Think about how you have spoken to some of your family and friends this week. Think about what you have looked at on your phone this week. 
and how it plagues you now with guilt. Think about what your mind has been thinking on today and some of the hostility you've had toward others. Or think about how you never seek God. Without Him working in your life, you never seek Him. Pretty quickly we'll see that we are dead in sin. We are guilty, corrupt to the core, without hope on our own, unable to save ourselves. But God has done something, hasn't He? God has done something to make us alive. God has done something to set us free. And this is what all those who are in Jesus have. And this is what we see in our passage tonight. And this is the reality of what those who've been baptized tonight have. And what all Christians have. And I pray that as we look at these realities, I pray that they would become soul-satisfying realities in your life. Because they are amazing. So what are they? What can we who are dead in our sin... What can we have? We who are dead in our sin, what can we have? Well, firstly, verse 13 shows God can make us alive. Have a look again at verse 13. It says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. We already saw that we are spiritually dead. It's a condition we all face. But God makes us alive. Just as He did with Christ, the verse says. Verse 12, if you look back, the verse before our passage, it said there and showed how God raised Jesus from the dead. And the same happens to those who are in Him, in Christ. They are raised, they are made alive spiritually, they are given new life spiritually. It says in 2 Corinthians, another verse in the Bible, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, again, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So when God saves, when God saves a person, they are united to Jesus and they are given life. They are made alive again. They have eternal hope. They have eternal life. They have joy. And they have as well new desires. New desires for God because they are a new creation. But how is this possible? How is it possible for us who are dead in sin to be made alive again? How is it possible to be resurrected spiritually? Well, it happens through a slow progression that we see in the rest of this passage. Three other things here that must happen for us to be made alive. And it brings us to the second point here. We can be made alive because God can forgive us all our sin. That's what we see, follow straight after that description of being made alive in verse 13. It then says... He forgave us some of our sins. No, He forgave us all of our sins. Think on that for a moment. He forgave us all our sins, past, present, and the future. Every sin you have done, every sin you will do, every bitter thought, every callous, cold-hearted word, Every evil action, every action you've done to hurt others, every way that you've rebelled against God, He forgave us all our sin. There is complete forgiveness in Jesus. Now, I've met with people who, when they hear that, they think it's too good to be true. How can that be true? And they think, how can that be true for me? God can't forgive me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what my life is like. My sin's too great. If you think that tonight, if you feel that tonight, let me say to you, God can forgive you. He forgave Paul, who killed Christians. He forgave David, who committed adultery and then arranged it so the husband of that woman was killed. He forgave Peter, who turned his back on Jesus. And he forgave me, the wretch that I am. And he can forgive you. He can forgive you. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done, He can forgive. Because He says that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Romans 6, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Your sin might be great. Our sin is great. It's deep. But God's grace is deeper. 
His forgiveness is deeper. And He is able to forgive and He desires to forgive. He's eager to forgive. So come to Him. But maybe you wonder, how is that kind of forgiveness possible? How can that happen? Doesn't God have to deal with sin? How can this happen? Or maybe you feel, my sin feels so great. There's such a burden on me because of it. There's so much guilt because of it and you feel heavy and you are sure that a terrifying price must be paid because of what you've done. How could you be forgiven? Maybe you wonder that. Well, you can be forgiven because that enormous terrifying price that should be paid has been paid. It has been paid. The price that you, for all that you have done can be paid. That brings us to the next point, the next verse in the passage. The next point is that God can nail your debt, your sin debt, to the cross. God can nail your sin debt to the cross. Look at verse, the end of verse 13 into verse 14. It says, He forgave us, God forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. We are in debt for our sin. We are in debt to God. And that payment is eternal death, Romans says. Just like any criminal, we have a long list of crimes against us because of all that we've done. We have a long list. It is long for all of us, and it stands against us, condemning us. And it condemns us And it stands opposed against us because it condemns us to eternal death. And every sin we do is piling up against us, condemning us to this eternal death that we deserve. But here we see this sin debt can be cancelled. It can be wiped clean is the picture. It can be wiped away. It's like we are in in a courtroom and the whole room is covered with a whiteboard. And the judge is there writing every evil thought, every evil crime, everything you have done, and it covers the whole room up. That whole whiteboard is completely covered black with a list of your sin. And then God comes and wipes it clean without a trace of blackness there, without a trace of a single crime or sin that you have done. Nothing left. The debt that we owe to God, it can be set aside, it can be removed, but it can only be removed in one way. We can't wipe that whiteboard clean, we can't remove our sin, we can't do enough good to outweigh that long list of crimes that lays against us, and God can't just ignore that long list. He can't just ignore that sentence that's against us. No, our debt can only be removed in one way, and that way is by it being nailed up onto the cross, nailed to Jesus. Now that, that nailing of a debt idea probably comes from what the Romans would do when a criminal was put up on a cross, they would often have a notice nailed up for the crimes that they were being put up there for. And here we're seeing that our sin debt is cancelled because it is nailed onto Jesus because he was put up for our crimes. The long list of our crimes was put up on His cross, nailed to God's Son. So you can be forgiven and you can have your sin debt paid for in full, but only if it is nailed to Jesus. He can take our sin so that we can be right with God. But if you aren't forgiven and you don't have that, then that long list that that we were talking about, if it's not nailed to Jesus, then that record of debt is still against you and you need to pay. Who will pay for your debt? Who's going to pay? It's either you or Christ. It's either you or it's nailed to Him. If you haven't done that, won't you let Christ take that debt? Why wouldn't you? If a criminal with a huge list of fines, huge list of fines that he couldn't pay, came to the judge and the judge says, I'll pay for them, I'll remove them. What criminal wouldn't take that? Who wouldn't take that? 
And yet some of you, maybe, tonight, have the offer of your debt of sin being paid for, and yet you won't come to Christ for it. I can't understand why you wouldn't. Your sin debt, sin debt can be paid. Everything you owe to God can be paid. Come to Him. But to do that, you're going to need to humble yourself. You're going to need to humble yourself to see that you have a debt. And it's a humbling thing, isn't it? To admit you have a debt. You owe something to God. You have done wrong and you owe to Him. It's a humbling thing to admit you have a debt and you owe thing to someone, things to someone that you can't pay back. That's what we have before God. So come to Him. Humble yourself. See you have a debt. And let it be nailed to Christ. Don't wait any longer. Don't wait beyond tonight. You need to come today. Come tonight to Christ. You need to come tonight. Don't leave it another night because your debt is great. Your debt is huge. The payment is horrific. Eternal death. And you are spiritually dead and you can't do anything to pull yourself out of it. So you must come to Christ if you, have, if you want to have any hope of having that dead, debt paid. But, but how do you do that? Maybe you're wondering, what does it mean coming to Jesus? How does, how does the debt get paid for us? What must be done? Have a look again at verse 12. There's a little hint, that verse just before our passage. It says, Having been buried with Him in baptism and raised with Him through your faith in the power of God, who raised Him from the dead. It's an important phrase here. We see here that those who are united to Jesus, they have what His death and resurrection achieves. But how do we receive that? How do we receive what Jesus achieved? Well, verse 12 says it is through faith. It's through faith. Those who have faith and entrust themselves to Jesus have everything that He achieves, everything that we've been seeing tonight. And did you notice it as well, all throughout this passage, in verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, we keep seeing this phrase, in Him, with Christ, in Christ. It's the same idea, the same idea of faith. Those who, you, who are joined to Christ, those who have faith in Jesus, they are the ones who have their sin debt paid for. That's your only hope, to have it paid, is by having all your hope and banking all your hope and trust in Jesus to pay for you. And when you do this, when you do this, and you are made alive and you are saved, you will be able to say like that famous hymn says, it is well with my soul. All that guilt that was felt is done away with. That long list is done away with and nailed to the cross. And you can say, it is well with with my soul. And as one of the verses say, it says, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. That's the wonderful reality for those who are in Christ, for those who join themselves to Jesus by faith in all that he's done. That's what you can have. But there's one final reality that we have when we are in Jesus. Verse 15. It shows here that God can shame the powers that will bring our sin against us. Look at verse 15. It says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now the rulers and authorities that are being referred to here are demonic ones, and Satan is the head of them. But Christ, it's saying, has conquered. He's triumphed over them. And, and what this verse is trying to show, it's trying to convey the image of what the Romans would do when they defeated a kingdom or a new nation. They would take that king and all their warriors and parade them through the streets to show they've conquered them. They would parade, parade them through the streets and make a spectacle of them. And Jesus has done this with Satan and all his demons. He has triumphed over them. How has he done it? Well, in particular, he has done it because their power is now gone. And their power in particular is gone because they can no longer accuse us before God. They can't accuse us of our sin before God. 
Why? Because verses 13 to 14 have shown our sin has been dealt with and nailed to the cross. We're no longer guilty for it if we're in Christ. And so they are disarmed of any power. They cannot bring anything against us. And this is a great hope because Satan seeks to destroy us again and again, often with guilt. He seeks to destroy you with lies that you can't be saved, that you've gone too far or that you can't be forgiven. But it's not true. And so if you are in Jesus, if you have the hope of what we've seen in this passage, then you shouldn't buy into those lies that Satan often brings. Instead, you should remember you've been made alive and you have new life and you are a new creation because you are forgiven. And you are forgiven because that debt was cancelled and it was set aside and it was able to be cancelled and set aside because it was nailed to Jesus and his blood poured out for you. And so you can have your debt paid in full. And for those who have this, when, when you have this, if this is true for you, if you are in Jesus and you have had your debt paid, then you need to realize you are free and you are free to serve him. And your soul should be satisfied in him. If we have this reality, we need to realize that it should transform our lives to want to live for Jesus and honor him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, it shows this connection. Have a listen if if you want. You don't need to turn there, you can listen. It shows that the way that we should respond when we realize our debt has been paid. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, it says, Paul says, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. It's the same picture that we've been talking about in Colossians. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. That is the response that must come to someone who has that debt debt paid. That is how we must respond. God has bought our salvation at the price of His Son. We stand at the cross, we stand at the foot of the cross, forgiven as Jesus' blood pours down because of our sin. That's what we have. And if that's what we have, how could we not want to honor Him with our lives? How could you not? How could you not want to proclaim Him and want to get to know Him more and want to live for Him with every part of your being? So for you who are saved tonight, for you who are in Christ, I challenge you to get gripped by these realities that we know about Jesus and what we have. Get gripped by them, because when you get gripped by them, then God will grip your life so that you fully serve Him. Get gripped by them, and you must get gripped by them so that you don't waste away your life, as I did for 16 years of my life. Don't waste away your life, deceived, chasing false ideas, false hopes, Instead, get gripped by these realities. And when you get gripped by them, God will grip your life to use it for Him. To help you see the need to get gripped by this, I want to tell and I want to close with a story of a man who who looked back on his life when he was getting closer to death. He looked back on his life and he saw how much he had wasted it. This man called Prudentius. He was born in Spain in AD 348. And after becoming a lawyer, he came to have an important role in the royal court, serving the emperor. And he was famous. A lot of people came to hear him. A lot of people knew about him. He became very proud. And he really thought he had it all. With all that fame, he had a lot. He had everything, everything he could ever want. But as he got old, he began to get scared. He was terrified as he got old because he began to realize that all of that honor, all of that fame, all of that money, those, that fancy life that he had, it was nothing. He came to realize it was nothing. It was going to do nothing and it was of no importance for him. And God opened his eyes at this point to see his sin, to see how he had been deceived into foolish thinking and how he had bought into lies. And God saved this man, Prudentius, from his sin. And he went on to devote his life to defending the Bible, to writing works, particularly poems of praise to Jesus, and writing of God's work in history. And he resolved 
from that point on, to not waste his life, but to use it and live for his Savior. And at one point, he wrote about this. He wrote about how in the royal court, you find precious cups of silver and ordinary buckets. And he wrote about these two things, and he said, I'm not famous or important, but I don't mind. All I want to be is a wooden bucket in the palace of my king. I want to give my life to serve him. I don't have much to give, but I give it to him, and I will praise him forever. May you today first enjoy the, the soul-satisfying work of what Jesus has done, and then may you devote all that you have and all that you are to the one who paid your debt. Let's pray. Father, we each individually know that our debt is great. We know the depths of our sin before you, and our sin is overwhelming when we start to think on it. If only we would stop more and think on it. And so I pray, God, right now that we would pause. Think of the way we have rebelled against you, the hurt we have brought to you and to others, and the sin that we continually do. And I pray, God, for those who don't yet have the hope of their sin forgiven, I pray that tonight they would have this hope. I pray that they would come to Christ and realize it's only in Him that their debt can be paid. Please, God, give them faith so that they can be saved. And for all of us, for those who have put their faith in Jesus, for those who are baptized tonight, God, I pray that you would take their life and that you would use it for them. I pray that you would take all of our lives and that you would use it for you, that we would use our lives for you, God, not for our own glory, not for our own desires, but for what you desire, because you have paid our debt, and you have spilt your blood for us. And so may, may we long to give all that we are to you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.